Good morning. So uh, last time I preached, I think I made, um, I guess I'll call it a promise, um, that I would talk about this. Um, so I think I had noted that at the end of, um, not every sermon, but a lot of a lot of the men that get up here and preach, they put this graphic at the end of their sermon and kind of the uh, invitation slide, if you will, and and this, you know, directly precedes the invitation song many times. And so I thought that we would look a little bit deeper into it. Um, to be clear, it's in part a investigation to see this graphic that we use. Have we given it our due diligence and uh, looked at the verses and looked at the content of this graphic before just slapping it in there um, after every sermon? But also in part is actually looking at the steps of salvation and understanding it making sure that we understand it fully well not only for our own sake but also for the sake of teaching others and for the sake of reaching others and that if we were to have someone completely new join us um in our worship off of the street that we could after services or um, through Bible studies with them, that we could help explain these steps of salvation and truly be able to bring people from sinner to saved, as it says. And, of course, the big question here is, what must I do to be saved? And that is a question that all of us should be asking. And um, something else that I wanted to bring attention to is that um, this journey... Uh, this this stair step, you know, like when we take the stairs at our own house or in a building, when we reach the top, when we reach the top landing and the the last stair, we're we're there on the on the last level, and that's kind of where this stair metaphor kind of uh, starts to you know you have to add a little bit of a caveat, and that's that the last step of remaining faithful is more of like a tightrope a tightrope walk where um, we are having to stay active and having to stay committed in order to re remain on that top step. And so uh, we're going to talk about all of those things this morning. So as the graphic draws out, and I'll jump back to it, um, God's part, those first three steps there. And so that's kind of how this sermon is um, structured, is that there will be a slide for every step here. So beginning in God's part, God sent his son. The graphic brings out John chapter 3, 16 and 1 John 4, verse 9, and I think these are both good verses to use. John 3, 16 reads, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. And 1 John chapter 4, verse 9, in, th in this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only Son into the world so that we might live through him. And we think about well, certainly this belongs under God's part because it was only God that could send his son to be on this world and to walk amongst men and to teach and be an example that we could read about in the word and read about in the scriptures that we could always look to as a shining example and that it was only his son who we could put our belief in and only his son that could be that ultimate sacrifice that we could be saved. And so this is, in addition to being God's part, this is the first step in that God in sending his son enabled all of the other steps to happen. Next, Jesus shed his blood. Uh, the verse that is drawn out by the graphic, again, I think this is a good one to use, Ephesians chapter 1 verses 7 through 10. In him we have redemption through his blood forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ, as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. And as Josh did a really good job of in preparing our minds for the Lord's Supper, we think about the fact that the Lord's Supper was instituted and is still followed by us as Christians today. And it is the reason that we come together on the first day of the week to remember Christ's sacrifice and to remember. And, and that's the thing that I love about 
the step metaphor is that it builds on itself and that we're remembering not only that Jesus shed his blood, but that God sent his son to die on the cross and it sent him to be the ultimate sacrifice for us as sinners to have redemption. And in this passage that we read in Ephesians, we see that this is, again, something that only God could do for us and that there is nothing that man could do to really have earned that redemption through man's own actions and that it really required Jesus to come and shed his blood in order for us to have that forgiveness of our trespasses. Another verse to read here, 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 through 21. Knowing that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. And so, once again, we see that the blood of Christ transcends things that is so much more powerful than things that man can observe or produce themselves, such as silver or gold, but that it really required that unique and precious sacrifice that was truly spotless and free, that was able to free us, as it says, that we were formerly ransomed, and that that sacrifice was able to bring us freedom, and still is today. And then the third and kind of last part of the infographic, if you will, that is listed under God's part, and that is that the Spirit revealed the Word. And uh, the infographic brings attention to John chapter 16, verses 12 through 15. And it reads, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he, is, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine, therefore I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. And so, here we observe how the, the Spirit of Truth has the authority that has been passed down from the Father and, and that the Spirit in revealing the truth, and revealing the Word and revealing the truth, that why has the infographic kind of brought this in? And as we look at the steps that we have, that God sent Jesus and that Jesus shed his blood, we have to have an interface through which we can interact with those blessings. And so the spirit comes into play. And of course, uh, I remember um, a few years ago, there was a study on the Holy Spirit and it was a multiple person effort. And it's a very complex topic. But the way that helps me think about it in terms of this infographic is that the link between God's part and man's part, the spirit, which is still under God's part and was enabled by God, allows us to have the word in, in our faith that the word comes from God. And so that's this um, second passage here from 2 Timothy that I would kind of add to the infographic, because um, that's one of the comments I have about the infographic is that there's just one or two verses for each, but we could certainly come up with more for each one. I understand why they did it in the interest of everything fitting on one graphic. Um, but also, they oftentimes just had one verse, um, whereas I think that when possible, as long as it makes sense in the context, it's always valuable to provide context and try to avoid taking just one verse um, out of many. And so... Um, in these slides, you know, if you were to go back and comp compare the slides that I have to what's in the infographic, you may see that I've um, grabbed some verses that come after the one that they've presented, or I uh, grabbed the verses that come before and after, and you also see that I've added some of um, my own to the slides here. But, of course, it all comes from Scripture, and it all comes from God, as we read here. All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. And so having that final piece of God's part that's listed there enables us to take the Bible and though it's printed by man and even though it's been translated and it's been 
rendered to us by man that scripture ultimately comes from God and that we can put our full faith in the scriptures that it is holy and that um, it allows us to read and begin to do man's part. So that's exactly the part that we'll jump into here. So as we go into man's part, there's going to be a slide for um, each step that was listed, but we're also going to talk about what we can do because the whole point and the whole value in things being man's part, and of course, man being used as a general colloquial term for humanity, um, that there's things that we can do at, at each step of the way. And the fact that it's the part that we have control over with our own actions is significant because we should be constantly looking on how to do those things. So the first step is to hear the gospel. Romans chapter 10 verses 13 through 17 reads, For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? How are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from who has believed what he has heard from us? So faith comes from hearing, and hearing through the word of Christ. And it makes logical sense too when we think of it that the first step that we have to do is to use our ears that we've been blessed with and and um of course, hearing here is, is used as a generalization because we can also read these things. And so even if you are unable to physically hear that we still have um, the scriptures in written form that we can read and there's different ways to interact with. We can even um, take it in in the modern era through video format or through audiobook format. And we have all these different ways to interact with the word. And in John chapter 16, verses 12 through 15, it reads, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they will all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. And so why I like this passage being used is because we see that in addition to hearing, there's learning. And that's where the phrase empty hearing comes or in one ear out the other. To just hear the word isn't where the bill stops, and we have to internalize and reflect on those things, and all of that is packaged inside of this step. And so when we look at the things that we can do, well, we can keep coming to church to make sure that we're hearing the word preached. We can engage in Bible studies. Um, you know, our congregation and our group here that meets offers Bible studies Sunday mornings and Wednesday nights, but we can engage in our own Bible studies outside of that. And if you have coworkers or neighbors or friends or family that that you study with and that you're helping them go through the scriptures then you know it's it's great if even if that you know, if the only day that works for them is on a Wednesday night and for you to take the time and have those bible studies but the important thing is that it goes both ways and that we're not only you know helping and working with other people when we have these Bible studies, but they're helping us in that um, as we go together into the word with people that everyone involved benefits and learns and has the opportunity to ask questions. And so along with that, we have the motivation, but also the requirement really to read and listen and engage with the Bible during the week. And that it's not only when we meet here together at this building that we're engaging with the word, but that whether it means that we're reading or listening or we're reflecting on as things happen in life and we think to the scriptures and we are reminded of the things that are written in the scriptures, that we would take comfort and take strength in the things that we read in the Bible and that we would find regular occasion and really every opportunity that we have to engage with the Bible and to engage with God's word. And the last thing that I added here are um, to watch sermons online. And this is something that I, um, as I've, you know, been coming up here more often to present lessons, I, I really see the value now in being able to go on YouTube. And Brent Willie is one of my um, favorite preachers in terms of just the way that he delivers God's message in the way that he does his research. And it's amazing to me that I can go on to the Los Osos Church of Christ YouTube channel and I can watch all the sermons that they have there and I can 
um, even, you know, they're on a different time zone and I can, you know, if I wanted to, I could even tune into their live stream and, and be kind of present with them and their worship. And um, it's another valuable way to engage with the word outside of, you know, just reading the Bible. That's something that we can do in addition to that is we can um, listen to these sermons from beloved um, brethren that, that we know from all across the, the country and also all, all across the wor world. Believe the gospel. In John chapter 18, verse 24, I told you that you would die in your sins, for unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, And without faith it is impossible to please him, for whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. And so, I feel like as we continue to go up the steps, it starts to become slightly more abstract, and it starts to become also much more personal, the things that we can do. So as we look into the bridge between hearing and believing, we have to stop and identify the things that are holding us back, the things that are stopping us from believing. And we have to ask questions rather than allowing us, uh, allowing ourselves to kind of end our journey there. Well, I don't really understand that, so I'm just not going to believe, I guess. And that we should kind of give in to our human curiosity that we want to understand the way that things work and we want to understand where we came from, as we've been talking about in um, Bible class uh, this week and last week, that we have that curiosity of wanting to know how things came about and that we should ask questions. And that asking questions isn't a sign of weakness, but rather it's a sign of growth and it's a sign of strength and confidence that we understand enough to know what to ask and that we're confident enough in our own abilities to take in answers and to take in facts to be able to answer those questions. And that through asking those questions and finding answers, that that's how we grow stronger. So kind of within that, I would say that another thing that we can do is to study more deeply about the things that seem confusing to us. Instead of being scared and shying away from them, taking them head on. And part of that is scheduling one-on-one -on -one Bible studies with people that you trust. And something that's so valuable about not just one-on-one -on -one Bible studies, but in general one-on-one -on -one conversations is that um, depending on how well you know the person, it allows you to get very personal about things that are holding you back. Because as we know, those things aren't always logical or things that need answers or have an answer that are held within the scripture. But sometimes it's something that's happened to a person in their life, an experience that they've had that's stopping them from believing. And it's not that they're unaware of the facts, you know or that they don't know what supporting evidences or supporting arguments there are for their belief, but it's that something's happened that is keeping them from believing. And so when we engage in those one-on-one -on -one Bible studies with people, it allows us to dig deeper into those things and, and really work with people who are lost and, and helping them find God. And then the other thing that I would mention too is um, that if there's something that's confusing you, um, but you don't necessarily want to get personal with a one-on-one -on -one Bible study, you can you can ask somebody directly for a sermon to be prepared about that subject or about that topic. Or really, you could leave an anonymous note. I mean, you could, seriously, you could write a note and say, I would really like to hear a sermon about this and just leave it on the back table. And, you know, I, I guarantee you that it will find its way to somebody who, who will preach about that. And, um, you know, as long as you're taking on, you know, headfirst those, those things that are stopping you, that's really the value there of, of this step. Repent of sins. Acts chapter 2 verse 38 reads, And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 17 verse 30, The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. And repentance is something I was talking to Sandy and I, Repentance is something that is interesting to me in the sense that I feel like I don't fully even understand everything that goes into repentance and how it's such a critical part of our salvation and that I would love for somebody to, to bring a lesson. You know, maybe I'll leave an anonymous note and uh, ask for uh, a lesson on repentance because really it, it's 
it's one of these huge turning points. And all, I mean, all of these steps are important, but it's one of these huge turning points. And as we look at the things that we can do, it makes sense why it's such a huge turning point because it involves understanding the consequences. And what I mean by that is realizing that without repentance and without making a change in our life, that we are dead to our sins and that the consequence is if we don't change things and if we don't change our life and put our belief in God and fully give ourselves up to him, that we're doomed. I mean, really, it, our, our eternity is doomed. And so it's realizing that status of being condemned to everything that is terrible about hell and everything that is, you know, everything that we don't want to think about because of how terrible it is and realizing that unless we change things, that that's the way that we're headed. And recognizing the need for forgiveness. And, the, and and that's where we really start to draw upon the first three steps that we looked at that are God's part. And recognizing that we need the things that God has done for us in sending Jesus and in Christ shedding his blood on our behalf. And that we need the word and that we need the spirit that reveals that word to us. And in order to be forgiven, in order to be saved from that condemned state, that 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 these are all things that we have to do and we have to make that turning point and that commitment to turning from sin. And so this step is is really important and really it you can you can expand upon these things and come to realize them by talking to somebody else and so that one-on-one -on -one aspect still applies, but the conversation has to really turn towards God and talk to God and and take advantage of the fact that we have prayer and that we have the ability to go before the Father and and reflect on the way that we've been living and to seek his forgiveness and, and ask forgiveness directly from, from God. And, and so, you know, we'll get into those things, but this really is, is I could see it being the most difficult step because it's difficult to admit that we are not able to do it ourselves and to admit that without making a change that we're headed to a very, very bad place. And something else in, in, in thinking about this is that Satan is only interested in you once you have come to know God and that uh, he doesn't have to worry about you when, when you're still, you know, without God and, and just kind of in that trajectory that he wants you to be in already because that he's got you right where he wants you, as the phrase goes. And, and that when we come to know God and when we come to this repentance stage that then he has something to lose and, and that he wants to get you back. And that's where we really have to be um, on our guard. And so that's, again, where I say that this is a, a big changing point in the journey of becoming a Christian and in, in the journey of being a Christian, because really it's an ongoing thing that we should never forget these things. And we should always be in this sober minded state where we realize the truth of things. And so the next step is confess faith. Romans chapter 10, verse 9 through 10 reads, Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. And something that's interesting to note, and again, I, I mentioned that in part this is kind of an investigation into the graphic. Graphic brings attention to Acts chapter 8, verse 37. And something that the Sunday morning class will get into eventually is talking about how we got the Bible in the sense, not in the sense that it's God breathed, but more in the sense of how did it go through these different iterations to the state that we find it in? And how can we you know, have confidence that what we read really is God's word? And Acts chapter 8, verse 37, it's actually funny because I didn't realize this because um, I went and, you know, plugged in. I always use um, Bible Gateway as an online resource to look up the scriptures and see all the footnotes and cross references and whatnot. So I plug in Acts chapter 8, verse 37, because I've copied it from the graphic, and it says, no verse found. And I was scratching my head. I was like, did I make a typo? Or, you know, so I said, read full chapter. Acts 36, Acts 38. <laughs> There's a footnote there, and I'm like, okay, let me click on that. And it is the case that Acts chapter 8, verse 37 it, the words there are missing from older manuscripts. They're not present in the older manuscripts. And that um, you'll find that a lot of Bibles don't include it because of that fact. And so, um, you know, Acts chapter 8, verse 37 it is, is Philip in, in the eunuch. And, um, and what's funny is that uh, 
there's plenty of cross references and even if you were to look at just the verses around it the point is still there so so that's something that i thought was comforting was that even though it's kind of this uh debate if you will that it doesn't change anything the points that that verse makes are are points found vastly throughout the bible and that it's just kind of an interesting tidbit that I thought that I'd mention because it, it happens to... I didn't think that I was going to find something that was going to relate to the Sunday morning class, but um, there's something right there. And so um, to illustrate the same point, we can look in Philippians chapter 2, verses 9 through 11. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And so, as we think about what it would take for us to confess our faith, um, there's kind of two senses here, uh, both of them important. If you haven't yet been baptized, and that's uh, the next step we're going to get to, but there is the sense of confessing the faith and coming forward during the invitation and confessing your faith and your commitment to God for others and um you know, I, I will say in that, that if you wanted to talk to somebody privately after services, um, just confessing to someone else that you have faith and that you believe in God and that you believe that Jesus is the son of God and was sent to the earth to die on the cross so that we could be saved and all those other things that we've talked about, that that is confessing your faith, but also that if you've already done those things, you've already been baptized and you believe that we confess our faith at every opportunity that we have. And that doesn't just mean going around and, you know, saying, hi, I'm Neil, nice to meet you. I believe in God. But it's the way that we act, the way that we present ourselves, that others can see our faith through our actions and the way that we present ourselves. It's also standing up for God, that if somebody is presenting an argument against God or is filing the image of God or the thought of God that we stand up for our faith and that that is a confession of our faith as well every time that we do that. And so um, even if you've been through this step before, confessing your faith is, is a regular occurrence and it's something that we should take every advantage and every opportunity of to do that. Baptism into Christ. So Acts chapter 2 verse 38 um, is a verse that we read earlier when we were looking at the slide on repentance. Um, so I've listed it here, but um, haven't uh, put all of the words from that verse on there. But we can also look at Mark chapter 16, verse 16. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. First Peter chapter 3, verse 21. And this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also. Not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a clear conscience toward God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So what can man or what can humanity do here? And that is be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. We can go anywhere where there's sufficient water to be immersed fully. And just reflecting on some of the ways that I've seen either firsthand or heard about secondhand or seen pictures of on a slide, that truly anywhere there's enough water, a you know, bathtub, hot tub, a creek, pool, um, trough that is used by animals for drinking the water um, and also in other countries where the water may be unclean or may be infested with small organisms but also large organisms that are dangerous and just having that faith and having that desire to be saved and to accept God's grace and gifts that he's bestowed upon us to want to be baptized no matter what the situation is. And that's really the urgency that's required is that we need to make the commitment to God without waiting. And what I mean is without us waiting and feeling that we can delude ourselves into believing that, well, there's always tomorrow, there's always next week because um, we don't know how long our time will be. I made a typo there, but um, we don't know what will happen to us even when we leave this building. And again, that's one of those things that's really hard to think about because we we have to act now because as long as the other steps are in place and we've gone through those things and we're in a position where we believe that we need to be baptized and that we have the full um we have heard and we've confessed and and 
we've repented and we've made that decision in our minds to make that shift and make that commitment, that the time to act is now. And then we have the final step, um, which, as I mentioned, is is an active step. Don't don't be tricked into thinking that uh, once we've reached this step that we're done, because that's exactly what Satan wants is to take those who are faithful and prevent them from remaining faithful. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 21 through 23, it reads, Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight, without blemish and free from accusation. If you continue in your faith, established and firm, and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel. This is the gospel that you have heard, and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven, and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. And so. I underlined that section, but I also bolded and italicized the word if, because it's important to not think of this step as a, well, I'm in a holding pattern. I'm, I'm here because I've made it, and I'm just waiting until my time is done, and I'm called up to heaven, and, and it's that kind of arrogance that we can fall into that we're not still working and, and putting in some of our life's hardest work in this step, not only to remain faithful ourselves, but also to work with others and bring them to a point of faithfulness and to be in that journey together. And it's also comforting too that, you know, this this is a long walk that we can have. If, if you were blessed enough to come to know God as a child and were baptized and kind of have been on this step for a long time, um, you know, I pray in and and pray to God that we're blessed with um, long and many years on earth, but that's more time that we have to remain faithful and more time that we have to work. And so to remain faithful in this step is is just an ongoing journey. And there may be times where we fall away and there may be times where we're off of that path. And I always love that song, Only a Step, that um, to step back onto that path, you know, that's one of the many blessings that God has given us, that we always have the opportunity to step back into the path of righteousness and that to remain faithful is going to be an ongoing battle. In Revelation chapter 2, verse 10, um, that verse has these words, Be faithful even to the point of death, and I will give you life as your victor's crown. And so truly, to the point of death, for the rest of our time, that is something that we have. But it's not all just, oh, you know, I've got all these things to worry about and I've got this ongoing battle to do. But just the privilege and the blessing that we have to be in God and to be able to have that confidence, like we were talking about in class, that we understand the important things of this life, that that God is the Almighty and that he's created everything and that now we have the privilege to sit here and understand and learn more about his world and this universe that he's created for us and that we don't have to worry about where did I come from and how did how did this come to be and, and, and what do I need to do? What is my purpose? And so, you know, it's important to glorify God and be thankful to God that we're able to reach this step and able to do these things. And so, kind of in closing here, what can I do to remain faithful? Well, we can stay dedicated in coming to church for worship. And I would say that more than just making sure that our bodies are here in this room and in, under this roof, is that when we're coming to worship, that we're never losing the value and the importance of our worship and never forgetting to glorify God, even when we're away from this building. And it's really retracing a lot of the steps that we've already done. And that's continuing to read and study and to hear the word and to continue to be in the Bible and to keep asking questions and growing stronger in our faith, and to take every opportunity that we have to confess that faith, to pray without ceasing, as we read in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, to always remember to talk to God, and to keep those lines of communication open, that we're also receptive to when God might be trying to send us a message, and when he might be trying to put things in our life that help us to stay close to him and to continue to be repentant and to recognize the need to be saved, and to continue to strengthen not only ourselves, but other Christians, our brothers and our sisters, and to bring others to Christ. So, 
I don't have the infographic up here because we've just studied it. <laughs> but I hope that this lesson makes it so that when you see that graphic up again, that you are able to think to the different things that we can do under man's part. That we would be thankful for God's part and everything that he's done for us, but that under man's part, that we would be mindful of those things that we can be doing. And that when we go to teach others, that we can be happy and be thankful in the fact that God has laid out this plan. He hasn't made it difficult to find and he hasn't made it abstract, but he's laid out all these things that make sense and that build on each other, that we can have salvation. And so if you're here today and those slides under man's part really spoke to you and you realize that one of those things is missing or that one of those things you haven't done yet, there's an opportunity on this Lord's Day where we've come together to worship God. Nothing would make God happier than to see another soul come to him and to see another soul saved from the grasp of Satan and to come off of that path of being condemned to the path of being saved. And so this morning, if you're subject to any of the things that we've talked about, you have the opportunity as um, Craig leads us in a song of invitation to come forward and let your need be known. So um, just make sure that whether it's during the song or whether it's uh, in private to somebody afterwards, that you don't leave here today while you're safe here in this building, that you don't leave without making that need be known. And just know that God is so happy. And, and I remember when I was baptized that so many people said, you know, the angels are rejoicing. And what a beautiful thing that is to think of all those rejoicing to see another soul saved. So if you're subject to the invitation, please come forward as we stand and sing.